May that be our experience as the Holy Spirit moves and brings light and life. Amen. Amen. I would have loved to have attended a church pastored by Pastor Ian Hartley, but the next best thing is to have him come and speak to us when he's here. As I get older, I realize that it's not really about being older, it's about the amount of experience that you get. So just an idea of how much experience Pastor Ian has. His daughter taught me in high school. But that is a blessing. To have that much experience, to have that length of time to walk with Jesus and to get to know him. And I know that that's where the message comes from today. So, Ian, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Good afternoon. A few weeks ago, we were at minus 44 overnight. I'm feeling a bit hot. You realize that minus 44 is more than twice your deep freeze temperature. It's quite cold. And the strange thing about Canadians is when they want to say something nice or affirm you, they say, oh, that's cool. <laughs> like, give me a break. Say, oh, that's hot. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it's nice to be here. I was meant to be in Israel but they're busy having a splat over there. So I thought I'd come here and see if there's any excitement here. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Would you mind coming up here? This man caused me to sin because he's standing up on the platform with his beautiful shoes. And why do you wear red-soled, red-laced shoes. Uh, can you tell me? <laughs> oh, it's his soccer team. I'm, get, I'm going to give you a better reason. The red reminds you of Jesus' blood shed for you. Wear them on Sabbath. <laughs> I want to talk to you about clothes. I don't want to talk to you about clothes. <laughs> I'm a bit confused. Uh, clothes have very interesting significance in the, in the Bible. I want to take you through a few of them, and I think you might find it interesting as to uh, what happens um, when we look at these. Uh, first of all, Luke 15 is about lost and found items. Uh, first of all, the sheep that was lost. Now, it was lost because it was stupid. Sheep, if you see sheep alongside of the road, slow down. They are not streetwise. If it's goats, put your foot on the pedal. There you'll be fine with goats, but not sheep. Uh, Jesus tells the next story about the lost coin. That coin represents the ignorant. They're just the coins lying, languishing, relaxing underneath the bed. There's no clue that it's lost. Just there, chilling. And then there's the lost boy, the rebellious and the willful lostness. Uh, and I want to focus on that third story. But I want to say this to you before we, I get lost in what I want to talk about. Is in all three of these stories, there is joy in heaven when one sinner repents. The Puritans were wrong. Long faces do not qualify you for heaven. One of the uh, part of the fruit of the Spirit, love, pastor, joy, second one. A believer brings joy, not condemnation, 
to the people they meet. It is part of the Spirit. Okay, enough of that. So the father, uh, in this third story, uh, here's the problem. Where's Glenn? This is the problem with all this experience. You've got so many stories to tell and so little time. <laughs> Jesus crafts this story. And Jesus is a genius at communication. And he's telling you a story, but he's not telling you a story. He's communicating with the deep recesses of your heart. Don't get lost in your brain. This is about your heart. So this rascal, rebellious son comes home. We'll read the story a little bit later. I can't tell it as well as Jesus told it. And the father gives the son his best robe, a ring, that's like credit card today, sandals, and a party to end all parties. Why did he do that? Now, I grew up with the idea, maybe I was told right, maybe I was just a bit, sometimes I know if I did my trick now, I could pass well. Maybe I was just a bit slow. But I came away with the idea was that God or Jesus or the Spirit puts the robe of righteousness around you because God can't bear to see you. And so you hide behind Jesus' robe of righteousness. And there was a lie straight from hell. But it took me decades to discover that. Why did you notice this question? Why did the son need the robe, the ring, the sandals, and the feast? Because the son had a problem, are you listening, with his self-image. And the father has to change that because he's the son, but he doesn't think like a son. He's thinking like a servant. Are you listening? The solution to our situation is not behavior modification, but a heart transformation. And it is in your heart that you condemn yourself and feel unworthy. And you are not a convict who's done his time and so now can enjoy the freedom of heaven. You are a royal princess, a royal prince. And Jesus came to put his arm around you and tell you, hey, we're brothers. So, Clothes are used for this. The robe of righteousness is not protect us from a holy God, but to protect us from our own warped, bitter, and twisted self-image. So here are some uh, stories about robes in the Bible. First of all, in Genesis chapter 3, you have Adam and Eve's sin. What happens? Fear fills their hearts. They hide, they make clothes of fig leaves, very scratchy, very fragile. Now here's the point. You see, I've been in many discussions about this, and it's about, um, well, God had to kill an animal to clothe them. 
You see that's the poor tent of Calvary, uh, and on and on it goes. And the point is this. God came looking for them. It's not that God hid himself and wouldn't look at them. He came looking for them, and they're hiding. And he says, where are you? And he's got a gift with him. You see, this whole thing's God's initiative. It's not we come to God and then something happens. God comes to us. And if we will let him, something happens. When Adam and Eve blame each other and blame God, you know, these stories are very clever. Uh, the Hebrews who wrote the Old Testament are very clever storytellers. And this is not about physical nakedness. It includes that. But it's about emotional distress, dissonance. Thank you. <laughs> um, look, here's the thing. I can go home after preaching an appreciated sermon and lie in my bed and think about all the things I should have said and didn't say, and there's some of the things I said that I shouldn't have said. <laughs> and I lie there and I think, wow, oh, 80 years old, you know better than that. I know you have a problem with self-image. That's the primary problem of being a sinner. And you can add shame to that, but we're not talking about that today. Let's talk about Joseph. Joseph's coat of many colors. First of all, his brothers pull his coat off. And then he's down in Egypt, and Mrs. Potiphar pulls his coat off again. But Pharaoh gives him a beautiful linen, kingly robe when he becomes prince of Egypt. You, you get the play on clothes here, and it parallels Jesus, because Jesus came... And the soldiers pulled his robe off, not once, but twice. Once they dressed him, pulled it off, and dressed him in a scarlet robe and mocked him as king. Then they pulled that off, put his own robe back on, and they led him out to crucify him. They pulled his robe off because the victims of crucifixion were crucified naked in the most public place to shame them. The, the Romans had taken the Phoenician invention of crucifixion and honed it to an exquisite degree that when they crucified you, they not only destroyed your body, they destroyed your reputation. They destroyed your very identity. If a Hebrew boy was crucified, his parents went to the synagogue and crossed his name off the family line. That's why the thief on the cross says to him, remember me. No one else is going to remember me. And here's grace. And Jesus says to him, I'll not only remember you, you're going to be with me. Do you know that there are 60 or more parallels between Joseph and Jesus? Um, you, you can read it through. Uh, if you want them, I'd be happy to help you. This is the high priest robes. I'm not promoting jewelry. I don't have shares in any jewelry manufacturing. 
But I'll tell you, the high priest was really decked out. Gold and jewels. I mean, it's just amazing. And we have the Puritans to thank, again, for telling us no jewelry, no ties. Pastor, repent. <laughs> We are really strange, inconsistent creatures. Um, so all those robes were there to celebrate that this was the holiest man in Israel. And he was your connection with God. And God lives in unbelievable splendor. And that's why he's dressed like that. Um, so great clothes give us confidence. We think differently when we're dressed up. And we wear special clothes to weddings, graduations, banquets, coronations, and uh, because it affects our thinking. Uh, and that's why clothes are used as symbols uh, in the Bible. So our robe of righteousness is not to impress God, but to give us a new self-awareness, a new way of seeing ourselves and other people. And the robe of righteousness gives us the confidence. On graduation day, and I've been to a few of them, <laughs> when you get your robe and you get your stole and you get your degree, you feel different. You've achieved something. And uh, that's what the robe of righteousness is about. The robe of righteousness, I'll come to it. <laughs> I want you to watch this. This is a passage that Jesus spoke in the synagogue at Nazareth. He just lifts this out of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, not financially poor. I'll say that to you. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. This is about emotional healing. This is not about material things. He has sent me, yes, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. This is not about a revenge war like we have in Israel. This is about God's taking vengeance on our brokenness. Look at the context. The Lord's favor to comfort all who mourn. Think of the angels coming to the shepherds in Bethlehem and saying, on whom the Lord's favor rests. I proclaim it to you by the authority of God's word. God's favor rests on you. He actually likes you. He made you so he could love you, not vice versa. He made you so he could serve you, not vice versa. When Jesus washes the disciples' feet, he's not doing something to set us an example. He's just being himself. He recognizes a need, he meets it. When he feeds 5,000, nobody asks him, nobody says a prayer to God for food. Jesus sees hungry people, he takes the initiative, he feeds them. When he finds a man blind from birth, who nobody imagined that Jesus could heal, he just heals him. I tell you, God loves you. And when your self-image is telling you the opposite, 
Look, then you have to make a decision. Am I going to believe God who loves me and trusts me and values me, or am I going to believe myself? And am I a greater authority on my value than God himself? You really have to make that choice. Otherwise, those voices never go quiet. And by the way, they never go away. They'll only go away at the second coming. But you can quieten them by remembering that God made you so he could love you and serve you. To provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Have you got it? This passage is about your emotional experience, not about material things. So Joshua the high priest, uh, he has the story, very abbreviated. I'm going to expand on it next week uh, about judgment and how God judges. And we have a lot of misconceptions on this. Um, so the angel said to the others, uh, the high priest Joshua is there, Satan is there to accuse him, and the angel of the Lord is there to save him. So the angel of the Lord, which is a euphemism for the pre-incarnate Jesus. So the angel said to the other standing there, take off his filthy clothes, and turning to Joshua, he said, see, I have taken away your sins. And now I'm giving you these fine new clothes. Yes, that's what it's about. It's to deal with your self-condemnation, the guilt you feel, the shame you experience, and to give you a new identity. It's not easy. I can tell you story after story in my life of how God has used other people to change my identity. I'll tell you one. Somebody, when I was an adolescent, early teenager, told me my nose was too big for my face. And when I spoke to people, I would talk like this. And then when I was 17 or 18, I was having tea with my cousin's wife, and she was, how do you say, easy on the eyes. <laughs> and during our conversation, she looked at me and said, Ian, you have the most aquiline Roman nose I've ever seen. I wasn't sure what all those words meant, but I knew. <laughs> ever since then, I've been friends with my nose. <laughs> She did not know what she did for me that day. You never know what you do for a person when you see the best in them and comment on it. When you see red shoes and red laces, tell the owner, I admire your shoes. He liked those shoes better now. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is what Christian fellowship is about. It is not about debating theological points. It's about caring for each other and meeting each other's need. When you meet a fellow Christian or anybody... Ask the Lord, help me see the best in this person and give me eloquence and persuasiveness to tell them. By the way, Glenn, my sister did a good job. <laughs> I mean, my daughter. <laughs> the command of the language is excellent. <clears throat> 
So, I'm giving you fine new clothes. It wasn't for God's benefit that Joshua got the new clothes. It was to change Joshua's way of feeling about himself. And the high priest needed that. God was, now, <clears throat> this happened in the Old Testament. The book of Zechariah is written about 500 years before Jesus. So this means that God was forgiving sins before Jesus died. I don't know if you got that. God was busy forgiving sins before Jesus died. Jesus died because God had forgiven us and never taken revenge on us. That's probably a paradigm shift if you're listening. We are not forgiven because Jesus died. We are forgiven because God forgave us. God is not a reluctant forgiver. Jesus came, we did our worst with him, and he ends his life saying this, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're suffering PTSD. They'll go home and abuse their wives and children and other people. They have no idea of the damage they're doing by their brutality. Calvary is the guarantee of God's forgiving love. Look, John, Jesus' best bud, abandoned him. A few hours later, Jesus is hanging on the cross. He sees his mother there, and he says to this abandoning disciple of his, Hey, John, you got to care for mom. Jesus has, sees value in John in spite of his performance. He sees the best in him. You know what that did for John? He felt like a creep. This is part of the genius of the grace of Jesus, seeing the best in people. So, I'm technologically challenged. I want to read you the story now of the prodigal son, so-called. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Can you imagine a son saying that? Well, I would have said, no, I don't want to talk like that in church. <laughs> you know, I mean, what sort of a son would talk like that to his father? His father probably had to remortgage the farm to give him the cash. I remind you, Jesus crafts this story because he wants you to understand what his dad is like. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed up all his belongings, moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About this time, his money ran out. A great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. <laughs> A Jewish boy feeding pigs. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for <laughs> your sense of humor. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the higher servants have food enough to spare. And here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. 
Now I'm no longer of worthy being worthy of being called your son. Please take me as a hired servant. This boy goes home for all the wrong reasons. He's not missing his dad. He's just hungry. It does not matter your motivation, your desperation for going home to God. You'll see why I'm saying that. And he makes up this speech, which reminds me of being in high school and being sent for by the principal. And I quickly had to make up a speech. It was never good news. Um, <laughs> sometimes it worked. <laughs> um, he's thinking of himself as a servant. He's no longer a son in his mind. He doesn't deserve it. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. His father had been watching and waiting and wanting that son to come home. Filled with love and compassion. Did you get it? This is Jesus telling you about his father. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. Mature men did not run in Jesus' day. It was in bad taste. He ran, embraced him, kissed him. And his son says to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being your son. But, but, <laughs> you know, that word cancels everything that came before. <laughs> you doing an excellent job for this company. We really appreciate you. But, Forget everything that's been said. But his father said to the servants, he doesn't even listen to his son's speech. Quick, bring the finest robe in the house. Put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we've been fattening and we must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead. And is alive. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Here's another story about clothes. Matthew 22, 11. The king came into the party to meet the guests. He noticed a man who was wearing the proper clothes, wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? The man had no reply. So you, to understand the story, you need to know the culture. When you invited somebody to the wedding, you sent them a suit or a dress. So this man had received a wedding suit, but he had looked at the wedding suit and said, I think I'll go in my designer jeans and that new Italian shirt I bought. The man had no reply. So they threw him out. Then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet, throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's number eight. Revelation 19. Let us be glad and rejoice. Let us give honor to him, God, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb and his bride has prepared herself. Verse eight. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. And this is in parentheses. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. Ah, see, you've got to have works. No, you weren't reading. She was given. 
And how did that happen? Because Jesus came here and lived the life I was meant to live. I couldn't live it because I have this virus of sin that points me to selfishness all the time. It's sickening when I meet a new person and they tell me, oh, I'm a lawyer, I think. You know, I need to update my will. Maybe he'll give me a steal of a deal. I just use people. It's embarrassing. I wouldn't confess, but I know you have the same problem. So it's like being at an alcoholics meeting. I can tell you what my problem is. <laughs> she was given, so Jesus takes all those things he did that I would have done if I wasn't a sinner. And if you Google my account in heaven, it says this, Ian Hartley, fed the hungry, cared for the orphans, visited people in prison, healed the sick, raised the dead. Say, I never did that. No, Jesus did it for you. Here's the problem. We sing with Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. If you ever think of praying for God, <laughs> unusual idea, isn't it? Praying for God. Well, by the way, Jesus, the first half of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is praying for God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's praying for God. Pray for God's desperation in trying to reach us with his love when we're so arrogant. So this is what it says in 19. Um, I've done that. She was given the finest pure white linen to wear. And the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people that he gave to her. Oh, Ian, you're letting down the standards. No! It's only when the desire to bless other people comes from your heart, that it counts. Otherwise, it can just be a feel-good exercise, dressed up in spiritual words. There are lots of non-spiritual people who are kind, helpful, caring people in this world. They just don't know. They're like the coin. They don't know. The Spirit inspired them to do that. You know. Welcome them into the family. Revelation 3.18, buy white garments found in me, says Jesus, so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness. We're not talking about <laughs> physical nakedness. We're talking about this nakedness of spirit, the self-condemnation that we feel. Revelation 16.15, behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. You know, the, the sixth seal is about the second coming of Jesus. And there are people crying out to the rocks and the mountains to fall on them because of the way they feel about themselves. That's the problem. It's not God's condemnation. That's your problem. Your problem is you condemn yourself. I know that because I condemn other people to try and give myself a little relief. That's what we need to deal with. Isaiah 61, I've, we've been there before. I'm overwhelmed with joy. You get it? I'm overwhelmed with joy 
in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding and a bride with her jewels. We've moved from the rags of self-condemnation to the robe of acceptance. And that's what it means to be a believer. It does not mean that you know where Jesus was born and how old he was when he was baptized and what, how old he was when he died. Being a believer means that you know in your heart that your identity is in, rooted in God and that he will accomplish his purpose for you if you let him. And stop trying to do it yourself. Jesus, yes, is your helper, but he's far more than a helper. He's your savior. A savior does for you what you cannot do for yourself. A neurosurgeon taking a growth out of your brain is a savior. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't want your help. Your help is a hindrance. Your part is to say, I'll sign the form. Get on and do it. <laughs> they put you to sleep so you don't mess with what's going on. <laughs> In a way, I've been speaking to your head. Now I want to speak to your heart. You know, Jesus came to embrace the world. He wanted to embrace us. And what he, we did was he we nailed him to the cross and then mocked him for his outstretched hands towards us. See, the issue is this. Can you stop God loving you? Is there something you can do that God will say, huh. no, that's it. Can't help you. You crossed the line. That's what the cross is about. That's why Jesus could not die in the Garden of Gethsemane. A private death would not have accomplished his purpose. He had to be tortured in public. He had to be crucified in public because we had to watch how he dealt with people who hated him. Because sometimes we hate him. So finally, we've got him where we want him. We've got God on the cross. We're going to look into his heart and see what's really in there. Is this all just a way of, you know, went to Dale Carnegie's course and was a good politician, or is God really in love with you? That was what was to be decided at the cross. And the devil is there pushing down on Jesus' hands and stretching the wounds in his hands and saying, this is it, you're dying forever. That's the cost. If you want, you want to go through with this? And Jesus cries out, God, you've forsaken me. Because that's how he feels at that moment. But look, how he loves the people around him. That Jewish boy crucified next to him says to Jesus, remember me. He knows no one's going to remember him. He's going to end up on the trash heap. And Jesus says, you will be with me. I don't know what Jesus did to solicit that man's question. But there was something in his body language that opened the way for that thief to feel this man might have compassion for me. And he looks down in his nakedness, looking at those soldiers gambling for his robe. 
I'm not very nice to live with when I'm ill or under pressure. Jesus is under the most excruciating pressure that you can put a person under. And yet he can look down at those men. They never asked for it. And he says to them, and he prefaces his remarks with father because he had to give his his pronouncement, authenticity. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I give you Jesus, who under the most extreme anguish and pressure can love people like that. That's why I'm a believer. It's not because of some theology that I read, but because Jesus has grabbed my heart. He's my hero. None like him. I will go to the ends of the earth. I have been to the ends of the earth for him. Look, we all want to be heroes. We all want to do something worthwhile with our lives. And Jesus is saying, trust me. Trust me that I really love you and care for you. And if you do not resist me, one day we'll be together in deepest intimacy for all eternity. I love you, Ian. Don't turn me down. Trust me. Thank you for being here. I wanted to tell you. I've told you. I'm happy. <laughs>